All righty, guys. So we're going to wait for some people to jump on like we always do. How are you doing tonight, Robert? I am doing absolutely phenomenal as always. That is excellent. How are you doing tonight, Kevin? I'm feeling wonderful. Thank you for asking. That is amazing. The man with the golden voice. How are you doing tonight, Thomas? I'm doing good, and I have Samuel Perry here with me in my hotel room. He brought me Chick-fil-A. Oh, my I goodness. Hang, I told him to hang here, and we do the show together before he comes out of here. That's awesome. It's awesome to have you here, Sam. Thank you so much for joining in on the fun tonight with tonight's show. So we already got some people online watching as we speak. So let's go ahead and roll our credits. And there we go. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight on the Teacher's Lounge. This, like all of our shows, we want to appreciate for allowing us to serve you. Please, as you get knowledge, go out and serve others and help them become a better cleaner and be a better person. You know, get out there and serve others in your community and serve those that have served you and share your knowledge. So let's go on to our first segment, which is the What Would You Set Do segment, which is where we answer questions. Um, questions and we talk about posts that was done in Facebook over the week. So right here we have an awesome one. Um, Vic had a bit of a basement cleanup. 175 gallon waste tank was filled up in two minutes. And look at all that fun goodiness down there. Sicked up uh, 57 tanks of water. So what would you do in this situation? Well, first, I wouldn't use my truck mount for that. I would use a submersible pump because most truck mount manufacturers do not recommend you doing that to your impeller. And if you have a like a bubble or thing going all that, they say it's bad for the drive shaft as well. The uh, all the weight from all that water, anything an inch deep or more, or anything that's that kind of volume of water. You should be using a pump out, not your truck. Yeah, I, I was hoping you'd bring that up. That's exactly what I was thinking too. Uh, a, a pump out pump, like Little Giant makes a great pump out. You can find them um, submersible pump. That's the particular brand that I like. And the other thing I would do is, as soon as I could start clearing things, I would get rid of as much of that stuff as possible because of the potential um, liabilities. Um, I was just wondering, Robert, what. Uh, wow. There's just, it's just, there's, there's a whole lot there. So I, I, I appreciate the comment from Thomas about using a sump pump or a submersible. Uh, the only thing that I would add to that would be to make sure that, uh, on your, on your submersible, you, you want to have where it's sewage capable, uh, has a cast iron grinder in it. It's more like a grinder pump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, yeah. Up, if you trash suck up any trash, it'll, it'll, it won't burn your pump up. But I mean, absolutely, I'd put a pump in, um, drop it at the, drop it at the lowest point, and let her eat. I, yeah. I, there's no way I'd put that in my truck mount, even though we put nasty stuff in our truck mounts all the time. That that would not go into my tank. And, and Vic is a terrific cleaner. I mean, he's an absolute terrific cleaner. Absolutely. A lot of times, absolutely. And I mean, he's top notch, top at his game. And, you know, honestly, I've been on these situations where I've had to use my truck mount. Something I'd like to mention is if you're going to have to run a truck mount in this type of situation where you're pulling this much water, please run a pre filter going into your truck so that that trash is not going into your tank. Um, if it hits your blower and your float switch doesn't function no more, it can nuke it and be done. Um, I'm curious, though, what Kevin would do in this situation. I know he would probably use a sub pump because he's a portable guy. Um, <laughs> oh, shots fired. Sub did you, did shots you fired. hear the yes. attitude in that voice? He's a portable I did. Guy. I totally did. Oh, my God. Well, you know what I was going to say is I was going to. I would call Tim, but apparently I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Beaker. 
If you're going to use Mr. Portable, Peabody, over and hooked it to a water claw. <laughs> <laughs> no man, I, no, I'm, I'm running. I'm running a trash pump all day. I, you know. Oh yeah. And now the, the thing to remember with a trash pump, though, is if there's anything floating, it will straight up suck it right out of there and just chew it up. So, yeah, it's the only thing you got to be careful of is you'll you'll suck half the belongings of that customer out of there with a big yeah. trash pump. But I, yeah, that's you know, obviously being a portable guy, you know. <laughs> I have a small tank, you know, so I'm going to have to pump it out some other way. So, but yeah. um, Tim with his big super sucker. Crash pump all the way for me. The five gallon But, you know, I, I've had to do something. Slow down, like Mr. Peabody. Sam says he uses a five-gallon paint strainer bag as a uh, to cover the pump with to keep it from getting any debris in it. Oh, that's brilliant! That yeah. is a great. Yeah, that's suggestion. assuming you want to wade down in there. <laughs> I'm so just dropping the hose down in there. What would you guys do about the remaining refuse? See ya. I mean, how many hundred dollars come down to? What is that? What is that First thing is take a lot of pictures. Is it yeah. a class one? Is it a class two? Is it a class three? Uh, if it's a class three stormwater or a class three water heater break, or is it a class two where it was, you know, uh, it's, 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 to me, that would automatically be a class two. Uh, oh, then, there's batteries and who knows what. Sewage. You know, I think you mean, you mean category. 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 Category right. one, two, or three. All right. Yeah, that would be. I think I see some poo poo. Sorry. Hello. Um, that that to me would be you know. Robert is busy at the moment. Please call back. back later. Yeah, call back later. <laughs> so from Facebook groups, apparently they all like calling me. They everybody likes picking on me. So I guess you I started guess it, Tim. Have to roll with it. What what uh, you know us apparently us uh, portable guys are gonna have to stick together. And throw it out to Mr. Beaker Peabody there. In the so you don't, you don't have your lab coat on today, dang it. No, I don't. I can put it on. Um, so you Paul, I should put mine on. Um, I'm curious what you would suggest doing from a standpoint of a person that's done fire and water restoration and ran a company where he's helped customers. We've already suggested the submersible pump to get the majority of this water out, but what is your suggestion in this case? If you're called on a Saturday night and you just have to get it got done and with all this trash down there. Well, you know, that that's a choice you make when you decide to get into the restoration business is you don't have to call crawl through crap. I mean, that's what the job is. And so you have to be prepared to do that. And then you have to have a team that's willing to do that with you. So, you know, you crawl through the the uh, the attics, you crawl through the crawl spaces, you go under buildings, you, you uh, clean up where people have died and all kinds of oh. Stuff. Tim Tim um, just died right there when I put yeah. my sleeveless lab coat on. Oh so, man. So so the, the thing is is also you're in a different situation because you're in a three party or more, sometimes four or five parties, um, situation. So, you know, what um it's not always your choice. What does the customer want? Uh, what does the property owner want? Uh, what does the management want? Uh, what does the insurance company want? What does the adjuster want? Um, what's the health department want? Uh, what do you want? So it becomes complicated, but typically uh, you, you look at all of those obstacles is, is things that are billable. So yeah. if I can move all that uh, all that carpet down there, all that stuff, you know, I bill for it. Uh, if I have to dispose of it, I bill for it. Uh, if I have to decontaminate it, I bill for it. So you, you end up having an attitude is the more work that I have to do, the more money I'm going to make. And that's kind of what makes you motivated to do it. Um, 
if the customer doesn't want to pay for it or, or whatever, then they have to make some arrangements of how they're going to deal with it. And then you have to get a commitment for them for how much how much time it's going to take them and you know how is that going to be handled? Is is, is the tenant go move the stuff? Um, you know, you just you just have to go from there. So every job's different uh, because there's uh, unique circumstances on every job. And if you're the personality type that's kind of a problem solver, uh, a solver, uh, maybe a go getter, um, you know, then you love that the challenges. Uh, if you don't like doing stuff like that, then you know, then you probably shouldn't be in that line of work is kind of what I'm getting at. And so like, if I go into a contaminated place like this, hey, I'm billing for, for decontaminating my equipment, my hose, my instruments, my truck, uh, I'm charging for PPE. Uh, I mean, all that stuff is just more to bill for. Uh, and, and that's the way you gotta look at it. And, and every once in a while, especially when it's emergency work, uh, you have problems getting paid and you just have to learn how to deal with that and if you can't afford to do work without getting paid every time, then again, maybe it's not the kind of work you should be involved in. Uh, but then also your paperwork uh, should be solid so that when you get a signature on that, that um, you have a way to enforce getting paid. Uh, and if you're working without a signature, then again, you know, are, are you, what's the risk versus reward? Um, you know, so I've done jobs where I've said, uh, um, I need a $10,000 check before we start. And people have written me a check for 10 grand because I didn't know what the insurance situation is. The owner lives in California. The owner lives in Canada. You know, um, well, then I just need money. That's a long and, way away. Uh, you know, and that's just the way it is. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we covered this one pretty good. Great job, Vic, by the way. I really appreciate you sharing this in our group. And man, you worked your butt off and you deserve all the praise in the world. Good job, man. So no let's problem. move on to the what would you do next? All right. So it's on electric vehicles. Ford has just come out with their electric van. And I am I understand one thing, whether we want this change to happen or not, it's happening. Um, the, the thing is 150 miles range that is going to be painful for some of you guys. I could probably get away with it cause I'm lazy. Um, <laughs> but I'm curious, could you get away with this Robert? Absolutely not. In Texas. Are you kidding me? I, I, abs absolutely not. Everything, uh, in, everything I, in Texas is 150 I, I, miles I live away. Right I think. now currently my right office is, or my house is 49 miles from downtown Dallas. Isn't um, everything in Texas 100 miles away, though? It's, it's 50, 60 miles most times. <laughs> like, when we say right around the corner, it's a little different than up there by y'all. You know, Chicago, Indiana, right around the corner is, you know, a couple blocks away. We're, you know, 30, 40 miles is right around the corner. Oh, look, but absolutely. Tim, Tim, had, to, Tim had to go a get a new coat. So, oh, yeah, mine's in green. No, yeah. it doesn't work. No, but um, just the range, it, just the range of itself, 150 miles. I mean, how many of you guys drive 150 miles a day just running service calls? Uh, we do. Oh yeah, <laughs> just just running, just running. Calls. I mean, I can get a, I could get away with it. Most days are under 150 miles, but the problem I see is, you know, whether we like it or not, it's here to stay. It's gonna happen. What is this going to do for the price of our precious gas vehicles is what so I want to What does that do to, you know, what does that do when you add a, a, a truck mount to it? Oh, you know, man, gonna, I can't are imagine. Are you going to put a truck mount in it with a tank? Are you going to do an electric vehicle? Or if you do an electric, an, an ATV portable, you're going to have to add a, you know, a generator. What what are, what are you doing weight-wise? And that's based on 9,500 pounds, if, if what I'm reading correctly. You add mm -hmm. another you know, 1,500, 2,000 pounds in truck mount, chemicals, hose reels. What you, well, I bet that 150 miles is empty. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're not going to yeah. make it That's not loaded down with 9,500 pounds. 
And ninety five hundred pounds loaded up on a trailer on the back of it, you could probably go down around the block. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's one of the curiosities I have. And I'm curious what Thomas, what is your thoughts on the electrical electric vehicle switchover? Well, there's a couple of problems with it. Right now, this technology doesn't make sense to me. Uh, number one, if you did the replacement on the batteries on these, when the oh. batteries go, the replacement is almost as expensive as a new vehicle. So the vehicles are almost disposable at that point to have a warranty of new batteries. Then, you know, you're looking at, I mean, you know, the third world countries that are mining the stuff for these batteries. They're using child labor. It's all of, there's just so much horrible stuff going on with this that until we have a better technology, they're they're pushing this too soon. If they're going to push this, they need to push about ten times as hard on the technology so we can do it well. And I would rather see batteries and solar panels on top of the vans to extend the range. And they're going to have to do all kinds of things to make these things really viable i mean yeah unless you're just doing grocery shopping with these electric vehicles you know kind of thing because i i drove here today i left atlanta drove 419 miles here today it took me about seven and a half hours had i had to stop at 150 miles and charge for a couple hours drive 150 miles charge a couple hours drive 150 more miles it would have taken me literally twice as long to do the trip to be able to be here and where would i stop in these places we don't have the infrastructure for the power grid for us to be able to stop and charge all these vehicles i mean now at my grocery store by my house they do have a place where you can plug in your uh, your electric cars but you know I, I i'd have to find where one of those is every 150 miles on every trip i made I just don't think we're ready for this yet. I love the idea, but I don't think it's a viable solution for most of us yet. Yeah, no. it, yeah. And, and unfortunately, it's but it's it's coming. So, yeah. Um, I'm obviously since I'm just a portable guy, <laughs> I don't know much. <laughs> Tim, what is the average truck mount running horsepower? Oh man, um, my peak is at twenty. I think it's 29 horse. Your average truck mount nowadays, they've kind of bumped it up to around 30, okay. 35. So you'll still be able to run average. it. In 2024 in California, you'll still be able to run your truck mount. But in 2024 in California, anything 25 horsepower and under is going to be outlawed. Yep. So you're going to have to figure out a way. So like power washers out there in California are trying to figure out what they're going to do. They either got to get really massive units to run or they're going to have to figure out a different way to do it because – they're going to be outlawed period so i think there's a, a good mix of things but like you said it's coming um i think a hybrid is a certainly a, a much better option at this point because then you can have a longer range and you have something to fall back on but mm -hmm. it's coming like it or not yeah and that's where i'm at with it. it whether we want it here or not it's gonna be here so we better get our minds around to that factor um, you know, just, just buy a Yater heater and buy a portable or an ETM, a portable that you can run from your truck and use that to charge your battery everywhere you go. Just leave just your rip the gas sleeves generator off your shirt running and get while you drive, you know, strap rip the a gas generator. Off, yeah. Rip yeah. the sleeves off your shirt get a portable, like yeah. some cool people. I'm not as cool as you, man. Just not. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right. So let's move on to the next what would you do segment. I think we covered this one really good. Now, this one I am really curious about. This guy got some of those glue mouse traps on his carpet, and he's wondering how to get it off. Now, I'm not sure. I looked at different glue mouse traps, and there's types that have both water soluble adhesives, and then there's types that have oil soluble adhesives or solvent soluble. Um, I was wondering what Paul would do as far as methodology and diagnosis on how to get this out. Well, it's obvious. You just apply some mice to those. That's spots. You're, you're right. You nailed it. I'm an idiot. <laughs> we just need lots of mice. That solves yeah, all the put, problems. Just in the world. push it down in there and, you know, they'll, they'll <laughs> take it with them. Uh, you know, with, with spot removal, you know, you can always... I love it on the internet. You know, somebody says, well, I have this spot, whatever it is. 
And then people just start throwing names of products out. Well, WD-40. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Oh. Peanut butter, you know, mayonnaise, <laughs> yogurt, you know. Um, Gasoline. Yeah, Blue. they just start throwing Blue. stuff. Blue. And, and, yeah. and the fact of the matter is that's just guesswork. So, so yes. what you do is you have to test. And so when confronted with this, what you need to do is say, okay, it's probably – solvent soluble probably and when you use a solvent it's the wisest thing to start with because you're not leaving the area wet and um you're you're also answering your first question is this a water-based product that i can remove with water-based solutions or is it solvent based so you take your solvent-based product of choice, whatever you like, and you apply it to the stain, and then you apply a towel. And if you get transfer, where it's actually dissolved some of it and it goes onto your towel, then you have learned something. It is a solvent-soluble stain. If you put solvent on it and nothing happens, it's probably water-based. And based on that result, then you can either go with different solvents because solvents tend to be selective. There's certain mm -hmm. types of solvents and they, they tend to be narrow in, in what they can do. So is it alcohol based? Is it petroleum based? Is it chlorinated? Is it uh, a natural citrus material? It, you know, you have to find out. Now, if you don't get any transfer, then you go to water-based, and then you just work down that. Does it come out with alkalinity? Does it come out with uh, neutral? Does it come out with acid? Um, does it come out with enzyme? Uh, does it come out with uh, redox reaction? You just have to work down the list in a logical order and then determine what that spot is. And, and that's universal to any kind of spot. And yeah. so what I would do with this is, you know, the answer isn't knowing, you know, me saying, oh, use WD-40. Uh, the answer, an answer is you need to discover what the right, right. product is. I'll now, right if you now. really have a difficult, unusual stain, one of the things I do, and I don't know why other people don't do this, uh, and I'll do it for you if you call me. I call the manufacturer if you have the, the product. And most manufacturers have a chemical department or a, a technical department. And I just call them and say, hey, look, at, I got some of your stuff on my carpet. What's a good solvent for it? What do you recommend for removing it? And, and those guys are sitting around with their fingers up their nose trying to think of what they're supposed to do today. Uh, most of those technical guys, they have nothing to do. And they love to tell you the answer to that question. So mm -hmm. sometimes uh, a call to the 800 number or visiting their website and, and calling the technical department, the nurse, not the salesman, not the management, but the nerds, they'll tell you exactly what you need to get oh, that. Nerds. I thought you said nurse at first. I'm like, they yeah. have nurses so, on Thomas, stand? <laughs> please tell me what you would do. Okay, I would never pour a solvent directly on the carpet. I apply a solvent to a towel so that it doesn't go to the backing. Then I put the towel on the carpet, and then I use a tamping brush. Oh, man. To Shocker. <laughs> no. To see if I get transfer. That's the safest way to not delaminate the backing. And I may have to try several solvents, like Paul said to see which ones do it. And according to the IICRC and most spotting things, they tell you to try a solvent. If that doesn't work, use a liquid gel and give it dwell time to see if that will loosen it up. If that doesn't work, then you go to water-based alkaline acid and then your oxidizers or reducers and oxidizers. But never without, never pour a solvent directly on the carpet. So, uh, I think we need to establish the fact that Thomas is the beaker of tamping, just like Tim. Tim, did you Tim, did you hear that? We've established that Thomas yeah. is the beaker of tamping. Yes. I'm playing the game with all of you. Can, can I? Oh, look at that. You mind, oh, did you got screwball? Do you mind? Uh, 
So you you're going to contradict Tom? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Right. okay, so Tom is correct. You, you want to apply your solvents to your towel to remove the stain. But just a little point here, when you're doing testing, you're, you're usually using eyedropper amounts or, or small amount of the cap. You're, you're talking about small amounts. And the physics of moisture <laughs> is that you go from wet to dry. So when you're doing testing, and, and I'm being very specific, testing, you want to apply the product to the stain and then apply a, a dry material, like a bounty towel or a mm -hmm. cotton towel. And then because liquids go from wet to dry, that's just the physics of it. And all you're doing is a test. But Tom's absolutely 100% correct. The practice in our industry of pouring something onto a spot and then taking your big toe in your tennis shoes and then scrubbing it in uh, gets that material into the cushion, the subfloor, the backing, and gives you all kinds of nightmares. So he's absolutely right. But during testing, we're talking about eyedropper amounts. And what we're looking for is solubility. Uh, we're looking for an answer. So we're asking a question through a test, and we're looking for an answer. We're not cleaning. So a little bit different. Sorry yeah. to be a nerd and be too That's technical. Okay. But I just want it, to explain it, It's things. fine to be a nerd, and I am guilty of using my toe and blasting a spot. Who else is? <laughs> yeah, there, there we go. So, I just watched yeah. someone do that with a hydrocorse <laughs> in one of these videos where they That's took the, the hydrocorse and puddled the spots, the and it disappeared and went into the backing, and I'm like, oh, my God, why didn't you just remove it first? Yes. I, I, I yeah, Go ahead, Kevin. All right, so... Uh, Thomas and Paul are 100% correct, and there's a lot of technical information there. So let me just dumb that down for people that are like me, okay? We need really simple choices here. So I'm going to have two different things that I'm going to try on that. I'm going to have a POG and a bottle spotter. One of those is going to work, and one of them is not. So if I take a, a, a rag and a, a white tear cloth towel, and I put a little POG on there, and I kind of just test that, and it, it moves – Guess what? I'm using the POG. If it doesn't, and I go to the volatile spotter and I do the same thing and it moves, now I'm going to start spotting that thing with the volatile. So that's kind of how I dumb it down. Um, you know, I used to carry the spotting kit that had 64 different chemicals. Oh, in it. Yes. yes. And you know how many, and you know how many <laughs> yeah. of how many of those chemicals I used? Two. <laughs> Yeah. It was usually it was usually the POG and the volatile and spotter. Honestly, so, not to brag, a citrus spotter. But ninety percent of the time, Silver Solution would get rid of something like that really darn easy. Yeah. So that that I'm just simple. I'm not saying any, any, right. those guys are wrong. I'm just simpling it down for people that are just like me. Okay. I I I don't. I've been through all the, the, the classes and I have all the chemistry stuff and, and I just, I still just love simple. I just, okay. Yeah. What, and plus you have to think about this in the form, in the, the aspect that if you have a technician that's going out to do this, you can't give them book and say, okay, go through this a by a B C all the way to Z. Uh, and then you have to compare this and you have to compare that. And then if you still are unsure, call the manufacturer and, Techs aren't going to be able to do that, so that's how I kind of like to dumb it down. I, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with two different spotters. If that doesn't work, that's the point. Especially if it's a technician, that's the oh point where goodness, they're gonna Thomas. they're gonna need to call the boss and and have a question. Thomas, thank, looking thank through you your for spotting cast caddy would be worse than going to liquor store looking at IPAs. Okay, let's move on <laughs> to the next. What would you do? <laughs> <laughs> All right. This guy's looked at a lot of equipment for commercial and residential. He's thinking of starting out with yeah, a, an automatic that. floor scrubber on a 175 and a floor machine and a wet dry vac. He's wanting to the tornado brand. He's looking to um, start into commercial um, stores, carpet, hard floors, gas stations, office and residential carpet cleaning. So the equipment that he mentioned 
is basically a janitor's closet at a hospital. <laughs> and I thought when I saw this, 100%. I just thought, wow. Kevin, yep. I just thought of Kevin. I just thought of Kevin and Robert. What does wow. every one of your hotels have? What does every one of the, and who are they hiring to fix all the stuff? It has wow. every one of those things in that, and there's, it is crammed in there too. You it never believe so they stuffed. could get, you'd never <laughs> believe that they could get that amount of equipment in a uh -huh. six by four closet. And but they do. I have a building that has two automatic floor scrubbers, three burnishers, five mop buckets, and they hire me to do all their cleaning. Yep. <laughs> so <laughs> this is this is what I have to say about the menagerie this gentleman's looking at. And I, I really want to help somebody out that's starting in our industry. That's why we have this show. I don't think I think the 175 is a great idea. I think every cleaner needs a 175. I think every most versatile needs machine a on the planet. Bag. Oh, most versatile. Absolutely. Unquestionable. I don't think anybody here will argue against the 175. Especially if you get a two-speed. Uh, two oh, two that's speed. the way to go. Then, then it's even more versatile. Yeah. and Twice as versatile in back. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and what you can do as far as carpet cleaning with a 175 is pretty unreal. I mean, the results you can get, especially with two-speed, um, stack good pads, unbelievable results. The automatic floor scrubber thing, I, in and out of a truck all night with a trailer, I've dealt with those nightmares. It's not a great way to start. If you're wanting to do anything as far as residential work, only one of those pieces of equipment, maybe the, the wet dry vac, depends on which one you get. If it's one with the big extraction shoe for slurry pickup for stripping, you know, I would highly recommend adding a proper extractor to that mix and maybe not going down this route because gas stations are the lowest of the lowest bid work. Yep. It is the absolute bottom of the barrel work from my it experience. It used to be, it used to not be that way when you had local people that owned their own gas station. Absolutely. So like here in town, we had Pete's marathon, we had Dale's mm -hmm. Meat Mart, you know, it, and, and I knew Pete or and I knew, and I knew Dale. It's not yep. like that anymore. Not at all. And uh, go ahead. I, I would say, you know, this is just my, because remember just six short years ago, I was in those shoes. Mm -hmm. So, and I, and I did all that. I bought the, the big truck mount and, you know, bought the, bought all the nice fuzzy, you know, brand new top of the line, best of the best of the best. And, you know, a lot of it is still sitting downstairs in the garage that's never been used. Right. Um, so what my advice, my advice would be absolutely. Um, and he and he says down at the bottom, I'll be cleaning commercial stores, carpets and hard floors, gas stations, offices and residential carpet. So uh, he everything doesn't, he doesn't really seem like he's got one target market picked out. But um 175 floor machine, absolutely. A wet dry vac, absolutely. Automatic floor scrubber, that's a stretch. Uh, burnisher is a stretch. Um, I, I would I would get your name out and get as much work as you can with what you have, and then build up your arsenal from that. You know, as yeah, work, as work comes in, and as you as you diversify into other things, and you get better at doing things, then you start buying little pieces of equipment at a time. Instead of spending everything at once, and now you're in debt with no revenue coming in. Yep. So I I know I I know that Paul in the past has suggested guys being very diligent about making Rumble. sure they know their target audience. Yeah. Yes. What would you like to share about that, Paul? Well, well that 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 question I didn't answer on the on the internet because. I don't, my, my thumbs are tired, but um, <laughs> what you really need to do is, is find out what you like to do and what you're good at and then focus on that. So buying all these various pieces of equipment, whatever they are, is not really the answer. The answer is what can you offer to, to your clients or potential clients uh, that you can do um what service can you do that they need and want to pay for? 
And mm -hmm. trying to buy a bunch of hardware to be successful is never, ever the answer. The answer is, who can you help? Who, who wants to work with you? Because you only want to work with people who want to work with you. So if that's window cleaning, then buy ladders and squeegees. You know, you don't have to buy an automatic floor scrubber. If you are going to clean upholstery, all you need is a portable. You don't, you don't need all this other equipment. So focusing on the equipment is the wrong focus. Absolutely. What you need to do is focus on your marketplace and do what you're good at. And I have customers that do some very strange things. I have customers that do only aircraft or mainly aircraft. Let me put it that way. I have customers that do mainly tennis courts. I have customers who do mainly handmade oriental rugs. Okay. And they found a niche. And the niche is where you need to get good at. But buying a bunch of hardware, that's not the answer. The answer is, who is my customer? How can I serve them? How can I make profit serving them? How can I make them happy so they're referring to other people? Yeah, and it's, a, it's an interesting thing because, like, I specialize in servicing out, outpatient medical buildings. So such things as doctor's offices, dentist's offices, um, home health care services, Meals on Wheels programs, those type of facilities. That's what I specialize in. But, you know, you know, it's like when you're in a doctor's office, you're not going to have a place to use an auto scrubber, really, really just the is all I would really use on this list. I wouldn't even rarely ever use a shop vac because a patient room's not large enough to even use a shop vac to suck up the slurry. I'll use a mop bucket and just drain it three or four times. My suggestion is doing exactly what Paul said. Find your niche, stick with it, focus on it, and then laser light focus. Um, like Kevin specializes in window care, but he also does everything we all, everybody else does because he does everything. And Robert, you specialize in hospitality. There's nothing in a hotel. Somebody can't get done by Robert, but he really says specializes in the, the hard surfaces and he's looking to add the window surfaces. So once you find your specialty, stick with that and run with that, but don't add equipment. You don't need shiny new tags on it. Also consider used equipment. Paul, go ahead. Okay. I, I hate to interrupt you, but but That's okay. you know the the other thing is you got to think about who your client is, and and we positioned ourselves into a niche. Um, but that's what I recommend. If you try to be a jack of all trades, you're a master of none. And so what you really want to do is focus on a, a group of clientele that can afford to pay more. And so our focus at our company uh, is uh, handmade natural fiber rugs. That's really where most of our business comes from. And so we found a niche where people don't really care what it costs. Now, I've been listening to, to you guys. And, you know, you focus on, on health care. Well, you know, health care is a very vital industry. And Absolutely. when it comes right down to it, saving somebody's life <laughs> is more important than what it costs to do your task. So you found a niche where really the bottom line is we don't care how much it costs. Yep. We, we just need to get it done because if we don't, it's a disaster. And, and so we're not going to even worry about it. So. Part of it for this gentleman's question is you need to pick an audience. Now, in the beginning, you know, you got to be kind of willing to take any kind of work you can get so you can pay your bills. But your focus has to be on finding the right kind of clientele. 
And, you know, I'm not going to sit there and tell you who that is because everybody, you know, there's more than one way to make a living. And you might come up with something I've never thought of. But doing, you know, and, and I don't mean to be sound prejudice or condescending or, you know, like that, but I can't help but say it. But, you know, if you're in the trailer part doing all your cleaning, you're probably not marketing to the right group of people. Absolutely. If, you, if you're doing gas stations, you're probably not in the right group of people. What's wrong with the know, part, I, man? I, I, I hate to say that because, you know, I, I feel like I'm being offensive. But if you're at the no, marina, claim, absolutely not, you're Paul. probably absolutely not. If you're at the marina, you're probably doing OK. If you're at the airport doing cleaning, you're you're probably OK. If you're absolutely. on the 75th floor. You're probably doing okay, but when you got dis- so. So yeah. here, here's a here's a little bit of an alternate point to that. Okay, so uh, I've got three points. First of all, I'm a jack of all trades, master of one. That's my okay. story. Master of one, master textile cleaner. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> now, obviously, we do a lot of stuff. We do a lot of different things. But here's the thing. We didn't do it all at once. So I, I've told this story several times. Uh, I'm going to tell it briefly again. I knew that I wanted a, um, a high pressure machine to do tile and grout. I waited till the opportunity came and then I bought the machine. Okay. And essentially that first job, I approached someone. I said, hey, have you ever considered having a tile and grout clean? They said, Yes. Now, of course, this was back before the chemistry had kind of caught up with lightning. I, don't, I, I haven't used it in months, years. Um, but nonetheless, I didn't go out and buy that $5,000 piece of equipment with all the fancy tools and attachments. I waited till that opportunity came. They said, yes, I want the tile and grout done. And it just so happened that it was a $4,000 job. So yeah. essentially, I was able to pay for that equipment. It doesn't really work that way financially if you really break it down. So if my wife was here because the bookkeeper, she would say that oh, that's not how it works. But in my brain, I paid for that piece of equipment with that job. And now we can do time to grow for anybody that we want. So um, and then the third point, you know, with the auto scrubber, that was my comment on this particular post is be careful about the auto scrubber. Yes. If you really think that you need it. That's fine. And I actually recommended a Tasky 855, I think is what I talked about on there, because it's a pretty eh, small footprint, versatile machine. But the problem is, is if anytime you're transporting a, an auto scrubber, you're going to get a, a couple of years of life out of it, maybe, because you just beat them to death. In and out of the trailer, they're bouncing around in the trailer. It's just, it's hard on that piece of equipment. If you can park it in a building and oh. that building warrants and we'll you'll end up saving the labor by having that auto scrubber great um we have about three well three we use it in the hospitals so we only have three hospitals that we use it in so we only transport it periodically so in in that sense it it can make sense but if you get a dual speed to start out with get a dual speed floor machine um i think a wet wet back is is great we have the uh uh, tenant typhoon it's a wonderful machine it's a little bit pricey but it works great small footprint um, here in michigan yep and and then wait for those opportunities to come up and when you see that opportunity come and it, it looks like it's something that's profitable and then you can market that to other people then go buy that other piece of equipment don't go out because you're going to drop five grand in an auto scrubber oh at easily. least so if you're going to spend five thousand dollars on that piece of on an auto scrubber, you need to be using it almost every day. Yeah. So wait till that opportunity comes. If you get the opportunity, then get that. We had buildings that when I was running the the big janitorial company, we would park. We would just we didn't get an auto scrubber, even though it was a big expense expense for the size of the account. The labor that we would save in three months would more than pay for it. So you have to do a little bit of math there and kind of figure some of those things out. But those are my points is don't just go in and just have this van or truck 
or a room full of equipment that you can just say, I can do all this. I can do all this. I started out just like everybody else. I had a Hawk machine and I had a mop bucket and a bunch of mops and there was no such, I couldn't afford a wet back, you know, so get the things that you, that you know, make sense. Wait for the opportunity for the other stuff. Excellent Absolutely. advice, Kevin. Excellent. hundred percent could concur, Kevin. Um, so it's time to move on to our last, what would you do? Fire. That will fix it. Um, so in this case, we are dealing with some dog vomit and the customer used Clorox um, huh. clinical non-bleach on it. Any suggestions? Fire. Actually, I would have Thomas look at this and I would consider doing either a complete um, removal uh, patch, possibly, possibly a bonnet insert. It's a very large area. The, can we blow that up, Aaron, please, so we can get right down into it? I looked at this, and, man, it's been worked hard, and there's so much going on there. And that yellow, I, I've seen that yellow with turmeric, mustard, that sort of thing. It looks like a dye issue. I, maybe try reduction a little further, but it's probably nuked. What, what do you think, Thomas? Well, there's a couple of ways. First off, I would probably, you know, that Clorox has an oxidizer in it, but not a very strong one. They just use it to kill the bacteria. So I might try a stronger peroxide and ultraviolet light to accelerate it so that I don't strip the color out immediately. Um, that would be my first test. I would just take uh, some uh, good, I like stain magic, the two part for this type of yes. process. Yep. I use it on mustard, and I have videos that you've all seen of me taking mustard out in three to five minutes with UV light and some stain magic. That's the first thing I would try. If that didn't work, I'd just strip the color out and re-dye it if I needed to. But uh, for that, I would use a reducer to be easier to strip the color out. But, uh, you know, it, it just depends. Test it. But as far as the damage and distortion of the nap, you know, that's something you can't really reverse once they've done exactly. that. You know, you either live with that or you live with seams. I don't care how good a bonded insert you do, and I'm pretty good at them. Uh, there's still seams. You're still, it's still a repair. You're still cutting through the body. My whole thing is I try to do that without that. It's like if I have a cut on my arm, I might get stitches, but I'm not going to amputate my arm. I only need surgery where surgery is necessary. So I love repair and I love bonded inserts. But here I would try to alter the color chemically to take that color out or to strip it and re-dye it before I would try doing a bonded insert. It's a 10-minute yeah, test. Uh, test to see if I can take it out. You know, rather that, Absolutely. And I, I agree with that and concur. Um, that's what I was thinking along. Um, I heard several guys in the comments suggest just cutting it out or it's just done. I do think that it's likely going to have some staining residue, but I do think you can make it look significantly better. Um, the one thing, though, is it's been worked hard. And so this is common for new cleaners. They see a stain, a spot, a spill, and they've had something that's always worked before. And they take the tamping brush and they use it for the wrong purpose. Yeah, they don't tamp with it. They scrub with it. Is a tamping brush ever used to scrub carpet? <laughs> and that is why we drink when we say tamping. And I'll tell you what, because a fabric shaver, you may find the electric fabric shavers. Yes. If, you, if that's a nylon, which it appears that it might be, you can probably heat it up really well and re groom it to help re to bring the nap back up some, and then use a fabric shaver to reduce the appearance of that nap distortion. It couldn't make it perfect, but you could do a little bit of correction to it to make it passable. Absolutely. And with, with this type of stain, and I do think it's going to be a stain no matter what you do. I really sincerely do. When I see that particular color of yellow, that's when I get terrified because normally yellow is the most biggest pain in the butt. Mustard, 
and turmeric. It's worse than red, for sure. Oh, way worse. Red is easy. And with it being dog vomit, it's not likely just the bile. It's likely the bile with the food, and the food probably had a dye in it. Well, the food has a dye in it, then it's mixed with stomach acid. And if it's a a nylon carpet, which is acid dye, then then it's set. So, you know, there comes a point where sometimes you just have to tell a customer, you know, this may not be worth fixing for you. Can you do a bonded insert? Sure. It's how long is it going to take me to do it? two, three hours. So I'm going to charge you $300 or $400 to take that out. They, they may not want that. Unless you're Thomas who does it in like five minutes with his arm tied behind his back. He does it with his toes. Watching my students or you've ever (laughs) in my classes to do a bonded insert like that. Let's take the big, let's take the biggest stain. Let's say it's as big as the palm of my hand spread all the way out like this. I would set my plastic template over it, trace around it in about 30 seconds, maybe a minute maximum, and binding the rows in between the fibers and everything, maybe about one minute to cut that out, one minute to cut a piece out of the closet, and about three minutes to install it. That's a five-minute or so repair per discoloration. And I probably do the two smaller ones as one piece. That's two bonded inserts. So that's that's two and a half hours in, in, 20 in minutes sleeveless time. And 20 minutes of tamping, in the words of Paul. My goodness. So uh, that's, yeah, that's two and a half hours in sleeveless time, just so you all know. Well, sleeveless time is not... I can do live videos and show you how I do it. In fact, you know what? Actually, if you go to Carpet Repair Master on YouTube, there are live Absolutely. videos watching me do repairs like this. Uh, and, and, and here's a point to remember. Here's a point to remember. Some people are really good at certain things, and other people are not good at certain things. I know, So I've had repair and reinstallation certification. I have color repair certification. I have fire and smoke. I have, I have, I don't know, 10, 12. I'm not good at repairs. I'm not good at color, color. Okay. I, I just haven't done it enough. So for me, even though I'm certified in it, I, I put that on my business cards and I, and I show people that we're, we're certified in it. I know I'm not going to be very good at that. And I know it's going to take me too long to do it. I mean, they're going to refer it to somebody else, or I'm just going to tell the customer, you know what? I can do the best I can possibly do. I'm going to throw some stain magic on that and, and see what happens. I have a customer that has a dog. Well, actually has two, one that had died and then it, and or they had to put sleep and then they got a new one. I just gave her a bottle of stain magic because I was so tired of going out there and spot cleaning because it just wasn't worth my time to drive to her house. And I said, look, here. So here's what you do. I I told her, I said, get a Bissell. I swear to God, get one of those Bissell Pet Pros. And I gave her a bottle of stain magic. I said, don't buy the stuff off the shelf. Don't get resolved. Don't get any of that stuff. Don't put anything on it. Just extract as much as you because you know when the dog throws up, right? You know when the dog pees, when it throws up, when it poops. Just get as much of the the stuff up as you can. Extract it out with just plain water. And if there's any stain left, spray the stain magic on there. Let it sit. And and it's worked. And it's worked great. And see, I've ended up making... This this customer is great. It's, It's such a long story. I've tried to fire this customer like seven times. And I can't do it. And it's she's like my five star review guru. Yeah, right? my, like my cheerleader. Right? I and and I just, and I can't. Right. I'm just like, I feel bad. I I hate going there, but I feel bad when I say I don't want to go there. So look, sometimes you just have to to look at the situation and say, you know what, I'm not good at that. I'm gonna either let somebody else do it, or I'm just gonna tell the customer, I think this is your best option. If you you know, if you have somebody that's wealthy and they want to spend whatever it takes. But honestly, at that point, they're probably just going to put new carpet in it. That's what, that's what my customer said. A sheer fire way of firing customer every last time sneezing diarrhea. It is time for our next segment, which is where I'm talking about metering systems. (laughs) Squeeze me. Excuse me. So I was going to talk to you guys about systems. Aaron, can we throw up our first picture? So I've been asked by, um, 
a couple of guys about metering systems on our trucks and how to how to set them up and how to use them. And I, 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 this is going to be a pretty brief segment tonight because I also want to get to Robert. He had some really interesting things happen. Can we go ahead and blow up that image a little bit so we're right onto those knobs, especially the one up top? Okay. So Show on Tim's top, knobs. Get a close-up of Tim's knobs. Okay, let's be appropriate. Um, <laughs> I'm talking so, about the knobs on your truck mount. What are you doing? Are I you don't know. Dirty mine, dirty, dirty Robert. everything. Okay, so... On the top one, you'll see on most truck mounts, you'll have two to two knobs for your meter system. And you'll have flow, set, and off on the top one. And then you'll have chemical, prime, and no chemical. So you need to have your first knob set on chemical when you first start up your machine and your second one set on prime. And that will prime the system of the machine, okay? That'll prime it. Then you need to take and set it to your chemical on your second knob, the one below it. You need to set that to chemical. Once that's set to chemical, then you can set it on flow set. Once it's on flow set, then you set your flow. And if we can back that image up a little bit and go down to the gauge, Aaron. There you go. Now you have this thing. It's called a chemical flow meter. That flow chemical flow meter reads in gph or gallons per hour so that means you need to know how many gallons per hour you're going to be introducing into your chemical flow so how much you're using for cleaning so most manufacturers including myself will tell you to set your gph depending on your cleaning circumstances most companies want you around four to six and that's pretty much it but there's more involved to this you need to know how many gallons of chemical you're cleaning carpet with. So if you're cleaning for so many hours, you need to know how many hours you're going to be cleaning and how many gallons you're going through in those hours. And that will allow you to be able to set this in a manner that you can predict how many GPH you're actually going through from your tank. And the tank is on this side of me. Tanks on this side. Everything's reversed on this camera. So the tanks on this side, that's that white jug looking thing. Now, I highly recommend you taking a timer. And as you clean carpet, you see how fast that tank goes down. All truck mounts are going to vary on how fast they use chemical, depending on your jet size and on your flow and all on uh, where you have your meter set and all of that. Um, there's also siphon feed systems this trunk this truck mount has a pulse pump and i have a pump right here Ugh, heavy pump i have a pump right here this is a pressure washer pump this is used in some truck mounts today in fact i'm using it to build something um and this is a this is a pressure pump this is a power washing pump and this is what most truck mounts utilize is a power washing pump and there's these little things right here and these are the different plungers on your truck mount there is a device that screws on top and that's a pulse pump and it takes the chemical from your meter system and it pushes it in to your system. So this is a force fed chemical injection system. That is the most ideal setup, but some truck mounts have siphon feed and if it's siphon, it uses what's called a DEMA valve and I don't happen to have a DEMA valve on me right now. I forgot to grab one from the shop. I have a couple out there that Thomas has sent me that um, we had split in half. But what a DEMA valve does is it basically uses siphon to feed the system. As you put more siphon, the higher the flow your wand, the more variance there will be. Now, there's a way of calculating that, and that's where you take a bucket. You take your meter. You set it wherever you want it set. You take that bucket. You hold your wand down and you watch where your GPMH is, and then you measure the controlled amount from your jug, from your siphon feed, from that jug, and then as, as you're holding down the trigger on your wand, you'll watch that jug go down, and then you'll know how much you're using. So let's say the gallon jug takes 20 minutes to get rid of one quart, then you know that within 20 minutes, there's six 20-minute, seg you know, there's three 20-minute segments in a um, 60 minutes. There you go. Um, that'll tell you that you're going through one quart 
per, you know, 20 minutes, that would be half a, that would be, that would be two GPM, you know, roughly. So, you know, that it's pretty simple to do, but every machine is going to be different. I don't know what else to tell you. You can't just go by that meter on the front of the machine because it can give you a false reading and it can be accurate, but it can also not. And Thomas has something he would like to share. I just want to mention it also depends upon the chemistry you're using. Because Absolutely. Some uh, Butler is the primary example of this. Butler's chemistry is different in that they use a higher concentration in the way their system is set up. And you can't do it the same as you do on the Hypermaster or the Pro Count. Because of the Absolutely. Way set up. So I just wanted to mention that. So it does depend on what chemical you're using as well. well. And and absolutely, there's siphon feed systems and there's pulse pump systems. Absolutely. Um, and it, it's pretty simple. It's a pretty, pretty simple device to understand, but it's important to understand. And it will really, really make a difference. I personally have on my ProChem Peak, which was the machine we showed there, my peak, I set my GPH meter to around two because it is actually at around four. <laughs> you know, when I do the math. So it's important to do that math so you know how much chemical you're actually going through on the job. Every machine is different. Every machine will vary. vary. Even if you have two come off the assembly line, those pulse pumps use a diaphragm, and it can vary depending on the size of the hoses, the size of your jets, whether you're running it for upholstery or whatever. So um, be, we had to kind of make this segment kind of short because – we have some questions that we would like to answer, but also Robert Quinn had something very interesting happen that he wanted to talk to us about. Oh, there we go. Hold on, Robert. I got your banner. Let me do your banner. I'm getting all nerdy on us. Give you a second to get your. All right, Mr. Liability. Tell us how we don't get sued. Uh, this isn't about getting sued. This is about. How do we keep our money? This that very ding 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 ding. Um, so this is this is for all of residential and commercial. If you take credit cards, if you take credit cards, no matter if it is a paid on completion, a ten day hold, a thirty day hold, a forty five, a net sixty, whatever it is, it is absolutely unequivocally paramount. That. And if y'all need to send me a message through Facebook and I will send you a copy of this. This is what is known as a credit card authorization form. If you use QuickBooks, if you use Square, if you use PayPal, if you use Jobber, if you use House Call Pro, any and all of them that you process your credit card forms through when you sign up or you can go into your merchant portal they have a form in there that is a credit card authorization form. The reason I'm bringing this up tonight is uh, Mr. Tom, Mr. Sam is sitting in the background there with Thomas Cermak. Sam was on a job with me back in January of this year in Florida. Um, on this job in, in particular, this is a color correction job in all of the bathrooms. Uh, this was a grout color match. Um, they had a bunch of bleach stains in the hallways that they decided to patch, which was a, as Sam said, a crap show of a job. I'm being politically correct here, of course. Um, so we did the job. Shining a turd. We we laid out we laid out all the term terms and conditions in our credit card authorization in our invoice. Uh, we followed those terms and conditions to a T had the invoice signed off on, on completion. We did something that we normally don't do. I financed out for four months, $26,000 over a period of four months for separate credit card authorizations because the building was, the building was struggling. Um, Hilton was breathing down their neck. They were getting ready to pull their name. They needed to work done. So I stuck my neck out. The last credit card was run on March 19th of this year. Tuesday of last week, I got a notification from QuickBooks from my bank that all the credit card all, all the credit card charges had been disputed. Wow. 
within five minutes of me getting that notification from QuickBooks that the credit cards had been disputed, I got a call from my bank that QuickBooks had pulled $26,294 out of my bank account. Now, the reason I'm saying this to y'all is this is real life stuff that just happened. This is yep. real life. I know a lot of guys want to talk about, oh, well, I do net 30. I do net 60. I don't have a problem with my customers. Good for you. In seven years in business, I've never had one dispute. Not one. Every single time I have a credit card authorization form in place. Have I ever needed to use it? Nope. The one time that I did need to use it, I had it. And it saved me $26,000. It's never a problem until it's a problem. I, mm -hmm. sent, I sent the credit card authorization form over to my bank. And I don't know if a lot of y'all know this, but your bank has the ability to stop a draft from being taken out of your account without your written authorization. Absolutely. So when I sent all my documentation over to my bank, my bank said Thursday afternoon, don't worry about it, Robert. It'll be back in your account by Monday. I woke up this morning, yesterday morning, and guess what? All my money was back into my account. Awesome. And I say that all to you, to all you guys. If you are taking credit card, no matter who your processing is, make sure that you have that credit card authorization form. And also on your invoice, you have to spell out the same terms and conditions on your invoice that is on your credit card authorization form. They have to match. It has to be the same language. On mine, it says, we will at all times exercise the utmost care in the handling and cleaning of carpet, rugs, upholstered furniture, and or hard surface floors. However, there is no guarantee against shrinkage, fugitive colors, fabric separation, changes in texture, stains, odors that cannot be removed, and other conditions that cannot be anticipated. No verbal promises or opinions of our employees shall be binding on us. We ask for your signature below to indicate that you are having the work done subject to the facts stated herein and at your own risk. All payments are due in full upon completion unless other payment arrangements have been made. Mm -hmm. Period. And if you don't have that on your invoices and you don't have that on your credit card authorization forms, when QuickBooks, when Square, when PayPal, when House Call, one jobber, whoever it is, when they pull that money out of your account, you have no recourse. It's gone. Yep, absolutely. That's and my message. I, <laughs> no, and it, it's an important nest message. It's it's a uh, it's cohesive with what we're trying to accomplish here, which is help guys out with genuine information. You got. You guys have got to protect your own butt. No one else worries about you but you. Um, customers, when they decide they don't want to do something or they decide they want to dispute you or they decide they want their money back, you, you have got your business. You've got to make the proper call to protect your business and protect your assets. In this case, what Robert was going for is a customer is literally trying to per commit theft of services. Absolutely. That is robbery. Yep. And a bank will not tolerate a theft of services. So when you have to protect yourself through those contracts and, you know, he really saved his own butt right there through a simple, simple contract. And it doesn't take much to do it. I encourage everybody to get a hold of Robert and get his uh, fancy little sheet of let paper. Me, let me add one more to this. Absolutely. So um, on commercial clients, I know everybody has their own opinions on commercial clients and whether you do a credit card authorization, whether you do ACH, whether they pay you by check, whether whatever the situation may be. As soon as you bring up the discussion of a credit card authorization form, 
every commercial property, I don't care who it is, every commercial property has a credit card for emergency services. Everyone does. Oh, absolutely. Period. If they say, I don't want to give you my credit card information, flag on the play. For me, I don't know how anybody else does it, but for me, if they won't at least entertain the idea of me being able to protect myself from the very beginning, that's red flag. And that to me is a big red flag. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, absolutely. And if it's a one time client, you definitely need it. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. If you have, you know, we have long term clients that we deal with and we're still. So I just pulled up QuickBooks. We have the best overdue invoice rate right now that we've had all year. We are only $14,714 in overdue invoices. There was a time that was at, I don't know, 43000 Yeah. So if you are whatever level that you happen to be at, that's what's going to dictate how you're going to do your terms and how you're going to going to work this stuff there's certainly no reason um no reason that you shouldn't have backups to your backup here's your uh credit card authorization here's this information here's the terms here have a signature have all those things you know done um and with big money sometimes there comes bigger risk so it's a great example of being over prepared so that you don't end up what did you say it was? $26,000 in the hole? Yep. $26,729.40 to be exact. Yep. And that, that's one of the risks of doing business, period, is you can lose money. And you got to build. It's like Paul last week was talking about reciprocity. You know, two weeks ago before the 4th of July, we had a show and we, we talked about that. And you, you got to build trust within your clientele. But oftentimes, sometimes the customers won't honor our goodwill and you know the the time of the handshake contract oh, on big gone. jobs it, it doesn't exist the same as it used to now there's nothing wrong with handshake contracts if that's the way you wish to do business but if they if they pull twenty six thousand dollars over your, out of your business i think you'll feel different hey brother if it's over 300 bucks i got an authorization for them on file there you go. <laughs> Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I totally agree. And thank you so much for sharing your experience, Robert. Absolutely. It means a lot to me. It means a lot to all the guys on the show. Yep. Now we got our last question. It's our last thing that we can do on this show tonight. And this is the question right here. What do you guys think about using simple water for rinse? Well, that's Kevin's forte. Um, thirsty water. Yeah. Thirsty water. It's magic water. Um, and as far as the neutralization of the pH of the chemicals, um, worn for higher pH, thanks. So here's the thing. Soil typically is acidic. So as far as the pH of your chemistry, you got to remember you're also going to dilute it when you're rinsing with your equipment. And as long as you're not going over and above what I consider to be reasonable pH over and above the standards that carpet manufacturers recommend, which is below 10, you don't necessarily need a rinse, so especially if you're using RODI or, you know, even softened water, which makes Kevin yep. want to throw up, um, you know, softened water. I'm saying it again, softened water. So right Salty. here's what I do. If you're, Salty. if you have, if, if you want, to, you know, not worry about it. You want to use something that's actually really safe on every job. You can use Silver Solution as your pre-spray. It's near neutral. Um, it's actually a little on the acidic side, but I'll clean most high pH cleaners. It's pretty amazing stuff. I don't think anybody will argue against that. That is used it on a regular basis. It's pretty awesome. Um, Tim, that is the worst chemical that's ever been on the market. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I love, I'm just You're, messing with you. I'm we're just, having I know technical you are. difficulties, and Robert has left the group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, you uh, know, and if, 
you know, here's the thing, Robert. I would love you even if you didn't like my stuff, but I, I know you like my stuff. I have text messages, so <laughs> yeah. yeah. So here's lightning. I wanted, I wanted to see. I wanted to see Kevin's hair stand up. No, his hair won't stand up. It, it, it did. Oh my goodness! It did. So this <laughs> this is lightning, and it can be used with a water rinse. Its pH is fairly reasonable. Um, it. I always recommend using a rinse when possible with it. The one product that I don't feel I, I would prefer if you were to use our product Thunder with you're going to use just water, though, because there's a little bit of oxidizer and lightning. And I do like you to rinse that when possible, if, if possible. Now, it can be used in other situations, but um, of course, there's guys that love to use it for VLM. But this is my personal opinion of it. It's. Just because you can do a thing and I do a thing doesn't mean it's always the best thing. Um, a lot of manufacturers. Yeah, Kevin will use it on everything for VLM. I've watched him do it. Although, yes, you're, you are correct. I prefer to rinse with lightning. I, I know. I know. You do. However, if you use Silver Solution and RO water, uh -huh. no rinse needed. And your carpets will be cleaner than ever been. I don't even think you have to rinse with Thunder, personally. Just no, a, a no. plain, good quality water. Good to go. Yeah, you're, and you don't always have to. And here's the thing, guys. You don't always have to over-focus on the word rinse. Um, rinse agents, you got to remember, most carpet that is heavily soiled is going to be on the acidic side. You put down your pre-spray, that chemical starting to neutralize. Now you dilute it further with further water. Guess what? You're going to be near a seven if you drop a pH strip on it. Yeah, um, you got to remember what the, the the original purpose of a of a rinse was. You either went really high pH, and you had to neutralize that, just like you do absolutely. with floor. So you, you like if you're stripping a floor, you got to use neutralizer because you need to bring it back. Now water will do it. You just have to use multiple passes of the water that the rinse agent will give you at the same time or you're looking for a chelating agent that's going to kind of help do the absorption process of the chemistry and the soil and all that so again if you're using a good quality water and a good quality product you can a lot of that men that old school i'll call it old school mentality you can just get rid of you just you just don't need it and, and you're saving a step yeah, and I, I don't disagree with that at all. I'm curious what Paul's thoughts are as far as an acid rinse. Is it always a necessity, Paul? Okay, so really, what you need to do is you have to you have to test. I know I say this all the time: test, test, test. But you need to know where you're at, and so most people are guessing. They they actually. Mm -hmm. have where they are so you you have to find out you have to measure things and so for example uh, when we start manufacturing chemicals in Grand Haven Michigan Grand Haven has two locations for taking for getting water one's the Grand River one's Lake Michigan and so I was measuring the water that we were using and it varied every day. So I finally called the city water department. So what are you guys doing? Are you nuts? Your water is totally inconsistent. And they go, well, that's because some days we draw out of Lake Michigan. Some days we draw out of the grand river. So assuming that your water is a pH of seven is a mistake. You, you have to measure it. In the country, it goes, from high to low, and that's just pH. And then your 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 solids, you know, how how hard your water is, is a factor. So so you need to think about those things and measure what you're doing. So the other thing is, what does the fiber want? So the proper pH for wool is five point five. That's the isoionic balance for wool. The isoionic balance for silk is 4.5. The isoionic balance for cellulose is 
Okay, so it varies depending on what you're cleaning. So again, I, I hate to make things complicated, but the fact of the matter is you got to think about what you're trying to accomplish. Paul so, wouldn't be called Paul if he didn't make it complicated. Sorry. Well, and that, that's why we have Kevin on the show. He dumbs it down for us. Yep. And, and, you, know, you know why I dumb it down? Because I'm kind of dumb. <laughs> I don't believe that. I don't believe that for I a second. I don't believe that for a second. Well, either I'm dumb or lazy, one of the two. And, and I just, okay. So, dumb, no. so like you got to think things simple. out. So, so the bottom line is, and, 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 and Tim nailed this, the pH of carpet is about four, maybe four or five, but it's between four and five. Okay, so your carpet soil or soil is acidic. So therefore, if we use, that's why we use alkalinity to clean it, because we want to neutralize the acidity of soil. So the idea of rinsing the carpet with pure water is a fantastic idea. I love it. And if you market that, you probably have a good marketing position that we rinse all carpets with pure, unadulterated, natural water. And Absolutely. As a consumer, I would buy into that. But as a professional nerd, I need to say, where are you ending up? So you need to do some testing. And what you what you want to re, what you want to end up at is as close to seven as reasonably possible. However, if you're cleaning wool, you want to you want to end up at five point five as reasonably possible. If you're cleaning silk, you want to end up at four point five as reasonably possible. I mean, it's called very from inch to inch, but you want to be in that neighborhood. If you're, if you're cleaning cellulose, you want to be a little bit on the alkaline side. Okay. About eight. Mm -hmm. So pure water doesn't get you there. Mm -hmm. But, but if you want to advertise that and, and you try to use pure water, then that's good. Now the other aspect, these are layered on. So it's not that simple. I'm sorry. The other thing is how thirsty is your water? And the purer your water is, in other words, the less impurities that are in it, the better rinse it's going to be. This so thing, Kevin, again, you need, to measure, you need to measure that. How pure is your water? The, <laughs> the purer the water, the more thirsty it I is, it. the more it's going to drink up impurities. So that's a factor. Hey, Tim. All said yeah. and done, typically we need an acid rinse because our cleaners oh, tend to be alkaline we up. and we need to compensate for that. Uh -oh. So uh, I hope I didn't overdo it, but that's acid rinses tend to be the right thing because we use alkaline cleaners. Absolutely. And I would like to. On that note, guys, we Tim. pretty much covered. Yes. Hey, hey Tim. Brush. Oh. Why did you do that to me again? Because I got to go put my daughter to bed. Love you guys. See ya. Love you too, Robert. Hey, hey Tim, one other night. thing. So we had a yeah. couple of people that had questions tonight. Um, yes. The, the last question if they uh, either message you or me, and then I, I've got to do it for Pineapple because he, he messaged me after he had to get off. Um, oh, absolutely. Anybody that leaves a comment, you get your choice of a Slavis Edition sticker. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, all you got to do is message Tim or myself and get your give, a, give me your address, and I will send you a sleeveless edition sticker. Anybody else? Any of you guys want one? I mean, if you want to be one of the cool kids, look. I mean, I even got it on the so and on the I lap. I will personally throw something into that package, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. Ooh. It will be chemistry. It won't be anything weird. Oh, because like chemistry is it weird? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, look Whatever. at us. I mean, okay. Okay, we just got Baker. real excited over water being pure. So on that note, guys. Pure water and chemistry. Pure water and chemistry. So on that note, guys, I want to thank everybody so much for watching. Kevin's going to give you guys some stickers. I'm going to throw some chemical in with those stickers. You're not going to know what you're going to get, though. But you have to message us. Go ahead and shoot us a message, either on Facebook or through YouTube or whatever. Just do it. I see there's still three people watching. This is your opportunity, guys. Go ahead and do it. Do it now. Give us a message. So on that note, guys, I'd like to thank everybody for watching. Looking forward to getting that response. We'll be sending you guys some stickers, and we'll be sending you guys some free samples, Some which I don't do, which is chemical. I don't give it away. On that note, thank you guys so much for watching. Just think it through. We really appreciate it.